begin now that I'm recording myself on the screen. Hi, everybody. How are you? All right, cavort is going to be our first word, all right? Sean, why don't you take that for us? What does cavort mean? Yeah. Yeah, exuberantly. That sounds fun, doesn't it? Exuberance is like extreme joy. So what cavort means basically is if you ever think of like if your sports team or something you were watching or something awesome happened and you started jumping around, you're cavorting, okay? So like when my son scored a soccer goal Sunday, I like jumped out of my seat. I cavorted. You know, I didn't dance around wildly, but um, you've got great news. You got your college acceptance letter. You're going to cavort around, okay? So it's to romp or prance around exuberantly. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be in reaction to good news for you to do it, but it, it sometimes is. You know, my kids, when they're just, my son, when he's just having fun, he'll just like start jumping around the backyard. Like he's having a good time. I don't know, he's excited. Um, or when he gets a Fortnite win or a new skin, he, the, guy, the kid jumps up and down, he's cavorting. I can't control it, it's bad. <laughs> All right, credence is our next word. All right, Wes, take that for me. What's credence? Belief, mental acceptance. Yeah, belief or mental acceptance. So this is why, I'm, that I like to take the time to explain a little bit. I don't really have the boardroom to put the other words I like to use up, but if you guys ever watch like Law and Order SVU or something like that, they might talk about whether or not a witness is credible. A credible witness is one you can believe. Credibility, someone's credibility is whether or not you can trust and believe them. Credence is belief, and this gives people trouble on the fill in the blanks, and I wanna make a note of this. You know, the sentence that's under the definition reads as such. Let me look it off your paper real quick. It says, the government and the public failed to give credence to the reports of an impending water shortage. If they did not give credence to it, they did not believe it. However, credence is a noun and not a verb. I can't say, I don't credence you, AJ. Like, it doesn't make sense. I don't give credence to what you said. It's a noun, okay? So keep that in mind. Another way you may have heard this word is some religious groups will have a creed. It's a statement of belief. Okay, um, so these are other ways you might try to understand this word, but it's a noun and that's important to know. All right, to decry something, all right, take that for me, AJ. Yes, right. um, to be then special approval to officially depreciate. Depreciate, sounds like the opposite of appreciate, right? So it sounds like a bad thing. If you don't appreciate it, you depreciate it, okay? Now, um, I want you to think about if you've watched the presidential debates or the vice presidential debates, the two parties, one party is always decrying the plan that the other one has. They're strongly disapproving of it. They say it's not going to work. They are decrying it. Um, you know, over 2020, there's been a lot of protests in response to court decisions or condemning the actions of, you know, one person to another. The protesters are decrying what has happened. Okay? It's a verb. Okay? It's something that you do. Um, next up, let me pull it up here. All right, to dissemble. Okay, why don't you take that one for me, Thomas? To disguise or conceal deliberately false impression. Yeah, so man, this is a fitting month for the concept of what it means to dissemble, right? Because Halloween is in October and we like to disguise our appearances, mm -hmm. right? Um, so that works pretty well there for us. Now, the other part of this is to, to deliberately give a false impression. That could be good or bad depending on the circumstances, okay? So maybe a bad case would be, let's say, you know, the, um, you know, the, the criminal moved into the new town and dissembled his true intentions. Uh, you know, he wanted, to, he wanted to deceive the person and take their money, but he gave them the impression that he was just a guy who needed help. So that, to dissemble and give a false impression in that sense is not good. But here's another context in which it's not bad. You know, if someone's having a really bad day, but they don't want their little brother or sister to know, they might dissemble their true feelings and just put on a smile. Not necessarily a bad thing in that case, okay? So to dissemble is to disguise, whether that means literally with a, with a, with a costume or a mask for Halloween, or to, 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 to disguise anything, you know? If you're throwing a surprise birthday party and you wanna hide the presents from your person in your house, you might, you know, dissemble it by throwing a blanket over it and just saying it's laundry, you know? So you can literally disguise and figuratively give a false impression. All right, next up is distraught. All right, take that for me, uh, Sydney. Um, very much agitated or upset as a result of emotion or mental Yeah, I feel like this is an easier one. If you're distraught, you're stressed out, okay? It's not like a quiet sadness or upsetness. You're very much agitated or upset. It's the opposite of being calm, cool, and collected. So a person or someone or something can be distraught. You know, you got bad news, you're distraught. All right. 
Next up is eulogy. Okay. All right. What is a eulogy, Devin? Read us that definition. Yeah, so it's commendation. If I said, I commend you for your efforts, that's the verb form of saying, I praise you for it. Uh, commendation is the noun form, like an official acknowledgement of praise. You received a commendation from somebody. Um, now, this word was a synonym for the word encomium in Unit 1. Encomium was a speech of formal praise, uh, you know, official speech of praise. However, eulogy, while it just means that, is often reserved in our, I, I guess, everyday conversation as for the context of funerals. And if you've been to a funeral, you, you typically have someone who gives the eulogy. And that eulogy is a, a formal statement, usually praising the life of the person who passed. Okay, So that's why this term is associated with funerals. There is a speech typically given to honor the life and praise the life of whoever passed. Okay, um, I want you to note right here that, that the antonym for this is diatribe. And I say that to you because one thing that the vocab book is going to do this year is try to show you the relationship between words. So if, if eulogy is a formal statement of praise, what do you think diatribe likely means? Is it going to be a good thing or a bad thing if it's an opposite? All right, so a statement or something condemning somebody or speaking bad against them. This is going to be a word in a later unit. I think it's in unit six. So. And it's going to list one of its opposites as encomium or eulogy. So there's connections between these words that they try to establish early on, just like eulogy was a synonym for encomium that we had in Unit 1. Okay? So they'll show those connections there. All right, next up is events. Okay, why don't you take that for me? Did I go through everybody yet? I did. Sean, you're up again. Go ahead. What does it mean to events something? Yeah. If somebody says, show me evidence for something, Evidence is something they can see, right? Yes, no? Bueller? Crickets? Evidence is proof, right? <laughs> okay. If someone said, you know, I said I wanted textual evidence in your essays. Where's the proof that what you say is happening in the story is happening? Or in the poem? Okay. To evince is to display clearly or to make evident. So um, I'll show you in the context, or I'll illustrate it in the context of the sentence. One thing that's kind of complicated about COVID-19 is that not all people with it evince symptoms. What does that mean? They don't show their symptoms. They're asymptomatic is the term for that. Okay, that's what it means to evince something. It's to display it clearly, to show it. Um, I don't often see it used in the, in the context of provoking something, but that's another dimension to it. All right, exhume is our next word. All right, why don't you take that for me, uh, Wes? Yeah, so, you know, it seems pretty grotesque to talking about bringing something up from the grave, right? Um, and obviously the two images I have on the screen right now illustrate that. I do want to show you, and I'm going to pull it up on the screen, that um, exhuming is something that does occasionally happen. And this is something from the world of art, okay? So I'm going to pull it up on my screen here for my uh, remote students. Okay. Okay. So I don't know if you're kind of an art person, but there is a surrealist artist named Salvador Dali. Okay, he's a Spanish artist. He was a quirky dude. Okay, his mustache was kind of his thing. Oh, yeah. Have you seen him before or familiar with it? Okay. So his artwork is kind of like bizarre. I'm sure it's meaningful and has, you know, stuff to it. But back in like 2016 or 2017, he died in 2000, uh, I'm sorry, in 1989. So in, in, in 2018, 17, whatever it was, Oh, let me add one more keyword to my search, exhumed. They exhumed his body, okay? And the reason, you can hear it, July 2017. The reason they did it, and his mustache was apparently still in place when they exhumed his embalmed body. And you're like, why in the world would they do that? Well, what happened is there was a woman who claimed that she was his father and that he had fathered her in an affair. And that because she was his child, she was entitled to some of his estate. So... There must have been enough to it to kind of justify exhuming a body. In this case, they ended up taking a couple hair samples, nails and teeth, and two bones. It says, the DNA of which might offer the conclusive answer to a high-profile paternity lawsuit. Paternity, father. Maternity, mother, right? And I asked this question, so can somebody tell me why there's never really a need for maternity tests and only paternity, paternity tests? Give me the obvious with how this biology works. 
the mom was pregnant. <laughs> the mom pushed you out, like, frequently. I mean, there are some cases that where there was separation at birth or something, but yeah. Yeah, Thomas. Was it? Let me see if there's any truth to that. It went missing. It was exhumed. So they stole it. What? <laughs> Charlie Chaplin was a um, silent film star. Um, let's see if I can play a video of him. Let me just look Charlie Chaplin. I don't want the story about his body being exhumed, but he is like this guy. Um, he was famous in the very early 20th century. Like, is there a video here for me? I don't want a picture, or I don't want his grave exhumed. Let's see if I can find a video of him. Friday's not that easy, but Grammarly can help. Let's skip this video. This is grammatically oh, maybe he wasn't just, was he not just in silent films? Oh, <laughs> why did I think he was? Is this him here? He did, did he get a start in silent films? Why am I thinking that? Okay. He usually didn't speak. Oh, he did not usually speak. I don't know much about him. So somebody stole his body, apparently. Who knew? <laughs> now you got it. All right. The other thing I want to illustrate for the word exhume, though, um, if you guys would turn to um, turn to the choosing the right sentences in the second page of it, I'm going to give you the answers to one of them because I think this sentence very well or illustrates this well. Take a look at number 20 on choosing the right sentences, or choosing the right word on page 38. It says, though the work hadn't seen the light of day for over a century, a daring impresario exhumed and staged it to great public acclaim. I don't even know what an impresario is, but context clues make me think it's something to do with the theater, right? Because there was some kind of work that hadn't seen the light of day for years, and he staged it for an audience of some sort, because there was public acclaim. So that's the other part of the word, exhum, to bring to light, OK? So I, I don't know how often you're going to talk about exhuming bodies from a grave and anything you read, but you might see it used figuratively. Okay. All right. Next up, feckless is our word. Uh, who? That's yeah, you, AJ. Go ahead. Um, lacking in spirit and strength, ineffective, weak, irresponsible, unwise. Sounds like a lot of kind of negative terms. Um, here's a sentence that features it well. The feckless teenager turned into be quite the mature, responsible adult. Okay. So the kid like wasn't real responsible, um, you know, maybe a little unreliable. If I was like trying to pick up this desk right now and I pathetically failed at it, you might say Miss Gers' feckless attempt to lift the desk was laughable because it was weak. <laughs> um, you know, the teacher tried her hardest to explain the math equation, but her feckless attempts were useless. They just were not effective at doing what they were supposed to be doing. Um, babies can be regarded as feckless because they're helpless. They require the care of somebody else to survive. So feckless kind of covers a wide range of things. Incompetent, feeble, irresponsible, weak. All of it's kind of negative, though. All right, next up is murky. OK, take that for me, Thomas. What does it mean if something is described as murky? It could be uh, a person or, a, well, I guess a thing. Dark, gloomy, obscure, Yeah, so the two images I showed, the murky waters or the murky skies from the smoke, they're, they're obscure. You can't really see through them well. Um, but the figurative meaning this, this is pretty practical, too. Um, let's say you're half awake, half asleep when your older sibling comes home, OK? And it's like way, way late. And you know, they're like, oh, did you hear me when I woke up? And you'd be like, no, I was like half awake. My, my memory is kind of murky, lacking in clarity. So that's maybe a way to understand it in that sense, too. If you try to make a point and you want, you, you want it to be clear, but it might be murky, all right? So that's the figurative understanding of that word. All right, next up is nefarious. This is one of my favorite words. I don't know why. Cindy, what does nefarious mean? It's an adjective. Yeah, do you, right? What's his name? Dr. Nefario. Dr. Nefario, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll talk about that once you read the definition. What's it mean? Like you don't have any morality, right? All right, he's, Dr. Defario is supposed to be the evil scientist. You know, he's obviously the, the Despicable Me movies. He's not really evil, but he's supposed to be at the beginning. Gru is not really evil, but he's supposed to be the supervillain at the beginning, right? And so he's called Dr. Nefario, okay? And that should make sense. Nefarious means evil, devoid of morals, reprehensible. It's the opposite of being honorable or virtuous. Did anybody, are you guys too young to watch the um, Austin Powers movies? 
You've seen him? Okay. It's like Dr. Evil. It's like that concept. So Dr. Nefario. You know, that's it's a play on that word. I remember. Austin Powers 1 or 2? I don't know. First one? It's been years since I watched it. <laughs> really? You're too young to watch it. You must have been young, because I was watching that in college, and that was like 20 years ago. I remember I wasn't necessarily watching it. It was more like I it was on the TV, and then my parents were watching it, so I kind yeah. of sat down. I have a horrible story of the movie Beetlejuice. Have you all seen that? Okay, well, my dad let me watch it, and they have a seance, and they turn into those green things and start rotting on the table. I had nightmares for years about that. I should, I was not, I should not have been permitted to watch that movie. Good. Every year, my cousin does the dance for Halloween. What is that? Like, you know, like the parade? Yeah. Every year, my cousin does the dance. Oh, yeah, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's old. Winona Ryder's in it. Alec Baldwin, Kim Basinger, maybe. Yeah. It's a musical too. There's Beetlejuice the musical. Uh, Seneca did it not too many years ago, because I am um, friends with the person who directs that show. All right, next up. Piquant is our next word. All right, Devin, what does it mean if something is piquant? Uh huh. Provocative. All right. So piquant, if something has a piquant taste to it or flavor, it's spicy, it's zesty, it's, you know. But in terms of what it means to be appealingly provocative, if you ever maybe have heard it be said that somebody has a spicy personality, you don't mean that they, you tasted them. <laughs> but they're, they're provocative, but in a good way. You know what I mean? Spicy in a good way. Um, stimulating to the taste or the mind, okay? So there's, there's two ways of, of, of taking that. All right, next is primordial, okay? Would you take that for me again? Sean, at the top. Yeah. Yep, the basics are the fundamentals. Um, the images I have up here, <laughs> a little random. Um, you know, primal behavior, primordial behavior, you know, when, when people were just trying to survive or if you ever watch like Planet Earth, you know, you see this primordial behavior. It's not advanced or civilized. It's like the earliest, most basic form to get your food is to attack and kill it. You know, I guess as a society, at least where we live, we're a bit more advanced, although arguably one could say, what's the difference if you just cut it with a fork and knife or you just go kill it yourself? <laughs> um, the image on the left is actually going to be something that comes up in our study of Beowulf. Beowulf is going to be um, chock full of biblical allusions. And we know this because the Anglo-Saxons had stories that were told by word of mouth, but it was when the monks in the church would record them down that we have evidence that those existed, and they added Christian elements to it. Now, I have this image. It's, it's from the uh, Genesis story in the Bible, and even if you don't have that point of reference as a person, it is important for, like, I think, educated people who study literature to know these biblical references because it has impacted society so much, and the literature is going to be filled with these references. Um, Adam and Eve supposedly, you know, were Eve was tricked by the serpent in the Garden of Eden to take the tr fruit of the tree of knowledge, and the first sin or primordial sin was committed. Okay, so that is is some context in which you've heard it. I also really like the sentence under the definition. Okay, so actually, could you read that for me? Who, Sean? Could you read the sentence for me that goes under that definition because it's a good one. Yeah, the primordial stages of most civilizations or communities. I think that that applies so much to our study of British history because I told you that the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes were these Germanic tribes that settled in, but they weren't really buddies. But the earliest stages of England formed when those tribes had a common need, keep the Vikings out in the 800s, and a common goal, keep the Vikings, you know what I mean? So the earliest or primordial stages of England, you know, that applies. All right. Next up is propinquity, okay? Nearness in place, oh, I'm reading it already. I guess I'll do that one. <laughs> Nearness in place or time. Kinship is the other dimension of this word. Um, does anybody live close to the school? Sort of, okay. So I'll use this example. Um, the propinquity of your house to the school building makes it easy probably for you to get to school on time, as opposed to someone who does not live close. Propinquity is nearness in, in place, okay? Um, in terms of what does it mean, nearness and time, if I have two appointments back to back, I might say the propinquity of those two appointments prevents me from being able to go make a Wawa run. 
the, the nearness and time that they are. Now, kinship is kind of a figurative understanding of this. Now, we studied the wanderer, right? You know, mindful of misery, grievous disasters, death of kin. And we said kin was your family, your close relatives. Kinship is the feeling of closeness, not in terms of me standing really close to somebody, but feeling close to them in that figurative sense, not literally or physically. Um, you might have heard the term, oh, the two of them, they're kindred spirits. Like their souls are kind of close to each other. They're like, they're, they're tight, like your best friends or something like that. So kindred, kinship, kin, all has to do with closeness. All right, the next slide, I don't have a slide for the next word because this was one they changed out, okay? Articulate wasn't in there and they put this one in instead. So I'm gonna, I'll talk about it. Um, actually, I'll have somebody read it because you've heard me talk too much. Thomas, what does substantive mean? Real having a solid basis, considerable number or amount, meaningful and non topic. Okay, substantive. We had substantiate already, right, as a verb. To substantiate was to prove with evidence, right? To verify with proof. Uh, from was that unit one, I think it was, uh, to substantiate. Um, if something is substantive, it has, it has substance to it. What does that mean, Ms. Gerst? Well, let's say you're waiting tables at the diner and someone leaves you a substantive tip, all right? It says meaningful in amount, right? It was sub substantial is a synonym for this. It means the same thing. Shallow people don't have substance to them. Does that make sense, looking about substance in that, in that sense? Like there's nothing to them of meaning. All right, you're so shallow, you have no substance to you. There's nothing substantive about you. That would be an insult, okay? Because if something is substantive, it has meaning, it has meat to it, it has content, there's something there. All right, so sorry I don't have a slide for that one. All right, next up though is propinquity. Sydney, oh, we already did that, sorry. Unwanted. Um, not usual or expected, not in character. Yeah, okay, so I have a picture of a cat hanging out with a bird. That's pretty out of character behavior for cats, right? It's not unwanted W-A, it's unwanted W-O, okay? So if Sean came into class and started yelling and screaming, I would say that's pretty out of character for him. That's unwanted behavior. He seems pretty quiet in class, all right? So that's what that means, okay? It's an adjective, so it's gonna describe somebody's behavior or their attitude or something like that. All right, next up is utopian, okay? Take that for me. Devin, what is utopian? It's an adjective. And the other part is impractical, yeah. So you guys, have you heard of the concept of a utopia? Some people will like form a commune and, and try to achieve a utopian society based on ideals, some kind of visionary view of what life could be, but the rest of the world's a hot mess. Um, you guys are probably familiar with the genre of dystopian literature. So that's things like The Maze Runner. That's things like The Hunger Games. Um, they're, you know, that's dystopian. Literature. It's about societies that are the opposite of an ideal world. It's really messed up. Now, the reason that the second part of this definition says impractical is because anything, anybody that's idealistic, they think like it, if you are idealistic, you have a vision that like things will all work out perfectly. Is that really practical or realistic all the time? Not necessarily. And so that's why impractical is, is used as a meaning for utopian as well. The antonyms for utopian is realistic and pragmatic. I'll say this, a utopian approach to teaching in a hybrid setting would be, I'm confident that my students will watch all my videos because they truly have a desire to learn. <laughs> it's a little idealistic and utopian, right? A more pragmatic view is they're probably gonna have to pick and choose what they have time for and are probably not gonna get to all the videos. That's a pragmatic view of things, okay? So that's the difference between the two. All right, next up. All right, verbiage is our next one. Um, am I back up at Sean? I think I am. Sean, what is verbiage? Um, if you've read an essay that's chock full of extra words that don't contribute much meaning, I might say cut the verbiage. Verbiage is a type of word, so that might help you. Nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, right? Okay. Um, if you ever read the manual for like, a new piece of equipment you got or looked at the PDF for it. Like it's so much verbiage and jargon, it's hard to sift through it all, right? So that's verbiage. All right, next up is verdant. Also one of my favorite words. All right, Wes, what does verdant mean? Yeah, so um, verde, verde in Spanish, right? If you're familiar with the color green. All right, so the first part of this is pretty easy to understand. 
Um, you know, verdant fields, they're, they're real green and lush, okay? Rainforests are rather verdant, verdant, okay? Now, the second part of this is probably the more practical understanding for you to have. Immature and experience or judgment. Um, did you guys ever see the movie The Maze Runner or read the book? Yeah. Do you remember what they call the new guys? They call them greenies. It's because they were the new ones that were immature and experienced. They didn't know what it was like to live in the maze and be subjected to that. They just climb over the wall, right? Well, because those monster things, what are they, the screamers? The Creepers. Creepers? Creepers? Grievers. Grievers, yes. And they say another thing. It's like they say nobody survived the night in the maze, and how do you know what a grieve is? I don't know. I don't know. They hear them out yeah, there. They know what they are. Well, they don't know fully that they know there's something bad, right? So they call them greenies. They're the ones that are immature. So green is often associated with immaturity or inexperience, being naive, okay? Um, so that is why. I always think to remember this word of bananas because <laughs> an immature or unripe banana is green, okay? And you could say unripe, why does that mean immature? Well, when something ripens, it fully matures, okay? So that is uh, a way to remember verde. And I think we're on our second to last word or our last word. Oh, we're at our last one. All right, viscous. All right, AJ, what does viscous mean? It's an adjective. Um, carbonate, gel Gelatinous, like gelatin, like jello. Or, blue, mm. oh, okay. or bluey fog, lacking easy movement or fluidity. Yeah, so viscous is going to describe the texture of something. Is it thick and sticky and gummy? It's viscous. If you guys know anything about motor oils, your quad, your, your, your car, the viscosity of motor oil is something that's measurable. And, and motor oil you is something you have to get the right viscosity for, the right thickness for the engine that you're working with. So you may have heard it in that context as well. All right, so that is viscous, and we are done. How do you spell vicious? Vicious is V-I-S-C-I-O-U-S, -I, -I, I think. Or no, is there no S? There might be no S. Wait, I think there is an S. Let's see, let's figure it out. How do you spell vicious? I think there's an I in there for vicious. Here, let me come my video here.